Wow. It's been a little over two months since we started doing these devotionals. Do you remember how we started? We looked at the journey from panic to peace, and we finished that, started a series that I called Heaven is a Wonderful Place. And we've been working our way through that now for, oh, I think this is the 11th installment. This is probably going to be the last of the installments on heaven. Unless, of course, you send me some uh, questions that I can, uh, uh, I can start dealing with. I'd like that if you would like to do that. Before we move on to today's segment, I want to thank a couple of people. I want to thank Joanne, who has been, uh, she's been recording this. And she's right over here to my right. You, you can't see her, but uh, she makes sure that uh, the camera's working and she has the, the teleprompter moving at the right speed. So it will look like I've actually committed all these messages to memory, which I haven't. I also want to thank Michael, uh, because he's the one who takes the recording and gets it ready to put on YouTube. But most of all, most of all, I want to thank you, because you've been watching these devotionals, you've been commenting, you've been letting me know that uh, they are of value to you, and, and some of you have even been reposting them. So thank you for doing that. I have one more, and uh, uh, it's this one today. I want to talk about the question of, will we have bodies in heaven? Or will we be simply disembodied spirits? And I think the best place for us to begin is in 1 Corinthians. It starts at chapter 15 and goes from 35 to 38. But someone may ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body will they come? How foolish. What you sow does not come back to life unless it dies. What, when you sow, you do not plant the body that will be, but, but just a seed, perhaps of wheat or something else. But God gives it a body as he has determined, and to each kind of seed he gives its own body. Now, if I'm going to be really honest, I, I have to admit that these verses aren't all that terribly helpful. Here's what Paul is saying. He said, we will have bodies when we get to heaven, but... I can't really tell you what they're going to be like. So thanks a lot, Brother Paul. Are there any places in the Bible that will give us a clearer picture, better clues, maybe shed a little bit more light on what our bodies are going to be like? Yes, I think there are. I think if we look at Jesus' post-resurrection appearances, we may be able to catch a glimpse of what our heavenly bodies will be like. I want to begin with the transfiguration. Okay, I know that this was before the resurrection, but I'm going to suggest that this was Jesus sort of taking his post-resurrection body on, on a bit of a test drive. Well, let's read Mark's account, Mark 9, 25, 2 to 5. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them to a high mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses, who were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters or three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. At the top of the mountain, Jesus met with Moses and Elijah, and his clothing suddenly became dazzlingly white. I remember the first time I ever flew out of an airport under cloud cover. It didn't take long before we broke through the clouds and looking back, I saw the tops of the clouds. The sun was out and the clouds and their dazzling whiteness almost blinded me. I wondered if that might be what Jesus looked like on the Mount of Transfiguration. The Old Testament tells us that when Moses spent time with the Lord, his face took on an unnatural glow and he had to put a veil over his face for the sake of the people. The other thing we notice is that all three, Jesus, Moses, and Elijah, were all recognizable. Well, let's move on to clue number two. We see it 
when Jesus appeared to the men on the road to Emmaus. We find it in Luke. He's the only one who records this. I'm going to read the first part of this meeting, Luke 24, 13 to 16 from the NIV. Now that same day, two of them were, were going to the village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. I'm going to summarize the rest of the story instead of reading it. Jesus notices these men are looking rather downcast and asks them what their problem is. They ask him incredulously if he is the only person in all of Jerusalem who hasn't heard the latest news about Jesus. They had thought he might be the promised Messiah. But now he'd been crucified, he was dead and buried, and all their hopes had been dashed. They're heartbroken. Jesus, pretending to be in the dark, asks them to explain what they are talking about. They tell him of the crucifixion, and then they say, well, some women had said that they had seen Jesus and that he'd been raised from the dead, but they were just women and probably not trustworthy witnesses. Jesus then, using the Old Testament, explained how the Messiah would have to suffer before his glorification. Emmaus is now in sight, and Jesus acts as though he is going to go on without them, but they talk him into joining them for a meal. Here's the really exciting part. Jesus took bread and he broke it. And suddenly they recognized him. And he then disappeared. Wow, Jesus was able to keep them from recognizing him. And then at just the right moment, he opened their eyes and they knew who he was. And then, poof, he was gone. That's even better than Star Trek, isn't it? When Captain Kirk would say, beam me up, Scotty. The resurrected body is not bound by the constraints of time and space. One last one. This is recorded by John in Jesus' appearance, first to the 11, and then finally to Thomas. We see it in John 20. Thomas, called Didymus, which means twin, one of the 12, was not with the disciples when, when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and, and put my, my fingers where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting. Believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. We've often called him Doubting Thomas, haven't we? Because he wouldn't believe until he had seen and touched Jesus' body. Earlier in the chapter, we see that that was exactly what the other disciples had done. Jesus showed them the marks of the crucifixion, and Thomas wanted the same proof. I think it's important that we hear that the doors were locked and that Jesus suddenly appeared to them right through the solid walls and the locked doors, and, and he showed Thomas his wounds and, and, and told him to touch them. Somehow the scars of the crucifixion survived and were still on his body. Many followers of Jesus have been scarred and wounded because of their faith. And I think that in our resurrection bodies, these scars will be like badges of honor. There are a few passages I would like to walk us through, but I'm I'm going to just tell you where they are and ask you to read them and allow the Holy Spirit to teach you what they mean. In John 21, Jesus appeared to the disciples as they came ashore after a, a totally unsuccessful fishing trip. They followed Jesus' advice and throw their nets one more time, and the catch was so huge they weren't able to haul it on board. Then they had breakfast with, with Jesus. I love the old hymn. Maybe some of you will remember it. Come and dine, the master calleth, come and dine. One last one. On his way to Damascus, according to Acts, in the ninth chapter, the apostle Paul encountered the fiery, blinding presence of the risen Lord Jesus. 
but I can't say with absolute certainty that, th that these provide us with an exact description of what our bodies will be like in heaven. But I think it makes sense. So again, I want to thank you for your words of encouragement as you have listened to these messages of hope, comfort, and encouragement. In just a moment, I'm going to close with the blessing of the high priest, Aaron. But again, I just want to ask you to send me a note. Uh, let me know questions that you might have about heaven, and I will do my best to answer them for you. And now, receive this blessing. Now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift his countenance unto you and give you peace both now and forever. Amen.